We're having some audio issues in our house. We might be switching computers. I know what you mean. <laughs> We're still working it. Okay, just remember uh, it's eating into David's time. <sighs> I'm bringing his, my computer up to another room where he was gonna do his Devar Torah. Okay. All of the things we never had to worry about before. <laughs> Like the internet dropping out. I agree. <laughs> I agree. You can do all that. Okay. What are you doing? I didn't touch anything. We saw you for a second, David. There we go. Oh. oh, wait a minute. Is the video working on your computer? The video, we see you now. Right now we see you fine. I'm not sure which, whose computer that is, but we see you great. <laughs> Push it off your audio because you're getting two audio feeds. I wonder if that's the problem. Oh, yeah, that seems like it was helpful. All right, can you still see him? Uh huh. Yes, we see you. We hear you okay. very clearly, I think. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Oh, we hear a bit of an echo, though. Hold on. Is my, is my audio working again? Alan has now come into the room to be our technical assistant. Maybe you could shut off one of the computers, then you would not hear an echo. That's exactly what's happening. That's what I'm trying to do right now. All right, all right, go ahead. Okay. Now we're all right. Seems, that seems good, yeah. Okay. Too many computers and too many screens in the same room. Well, what to talk about? These are the times that try men's souls. The opening line of Thomas Paine's Revolutionary War pamphlet series, The American Crisis, resonates with me as much today as it probably did during that bleak winter of 1776. Like our patriot ancestors, we feel as if we are locked in a struggle each side believes it must win to preserve America. After a bruising political campaign and the emotional roller coaster of this past week, we are all feeling the pressure of the conflict. Each side remains resolute, and we feel our nation's once shared sense of direction and purpose weaken under the strain. Each side eagerly desired the vic victory on Tuesday and relief from the struggle but fear of what might befall our, their cause if they are defeated. Neither side got a resounding victory and each side is emboldened by partial vindication. Reconciliation seems like a distant dream. Ah, the will of the people. Who knows what that means anymore? We look to better days ahead and a much needed rev revitalization of our somewhat broken democracy. The best way to move into the future is to step into it putting our focus in the, on the vast common ground we share with them, the other half of the country, who we are convinced was kind of misguided to vote for that guy, 
and I'm purposely leaving the pronouns so that you can fill in whoever you want. The text on which I wish to reflect is found in our Parsha in chapter 18 of Breshit. It recounts the inequity of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. So much, so much inequity, iniquity. That iniquity as to render the necessary intervention of God to carry out an act of justice and halt the evil by destroying those, those cities. God decided to reveal to Abraham what was about to happen and tells him the seriousness of the evil and its terrible consequences. Because Abraham is his chosen one, chosen to become a great leader of people and to be a blessing. Abraham is on a mission. Through him, God wishes to bring humanity back to faith, to obedience and to justice. And now Abraham shows he is open to pursuing justice and to caring about a world beyond his own. He prays for those who are about to be punished and he prays that they be saved. Abraham sets out the problem immediately in all its gravity and says to God, will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? That if there are 50 innocents in the city, will you then wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of the innocent 50 who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty, so that innocent and guilty fare alike. Far be it from you, Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? With these words, with great courage, Abraham puts before God the need to avoid blanket judgment. If the city is culpable, is it right to condemn its offense and inflict punishment? Affirms the, but affirms the patriarch. It would be unjust to punish in an indiscriminate way, in an indiscriminate way, all the inhabitants. If there are innocents in the city, perhaps they can form the nucleus of change. A God who is just cannot act like that, Abraham says. If we read the text closely, we realize that Abraham's request is even more profound because he, is not, he does not limit himself to ask for the salvation of the innocent. Abraham asks for forgiveness for the whole city and he does so appealing to God's justice. He says to God, Will you destroy the place and not spare it, meaning all of it, for the 50 righteous who are in it? By doing so, he puts into play a different kind of justice, not the one that limits itself to punishing the guilty, but a divine justice which seeks good and creates, it creates forgiveness that could transform the entire society. Hence, with his prayer, Abraham does not invoke a re re retributive justice, but an intervention of merciful salvation to give everyone another chance. Abraham's approach can be simply synthesized this way. Obviously the innocent cannot be treated as the guilty. This wouldn't be fair. Instead, it's necessary to treat the guilty as innocent, implementing a superior justice for everyone. God hears Abraham and agrees to forgive the entire city if 50 righteous can be found. God says, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. In other words, the 50 might be a force for good, and there is hope for the future of the entire community. Abraham then bargains the number of innocent necessary for salvation progressively lower. If there's 50, perhaps 45 would be enough, and down to 10. Perhaps they can be found there. And the smaller the number becomes, the greater would be the manifestation of God's mercy. God listens with patience and accepts and repeats every time Abraham asks, I will spare, I will not destroy, I will not do it. Thus, by the intercession of Abraham, Sodom can be saved if there are just 10 innocents without, within the city. The reason Abraham stops at 10 is not stated in the text. Perhaps it is more than a coincidence that this coincides with the number of people we need for a minion. It's a small number, but from only 10, we know great things are possible. Could it be that with just 10, we cease to be a random collection of people and become a force for doing good in the community and by extension, the world? The prophet Jeremiah said, walk about the streets of Jerusalem, look and take note, find a person who does justice and seeks truth. Compare for a moment with me Abraham's intercession on behalf of Sodom with Noah's reaction when God tells Noah he intends to destroy the world. 
How are we to understand the differences between Noah, who walked with God, and Abraham, who walked before God? In both stories, God shares his intentions with his chosen leader. Noah, unquestioning, goes along with God's judgment of society and proceeds to build the ark to save himself and his family. Abraham, however, has the chutzpah to challenge God's decision to destroy the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham actively pleads on behalf of the other side and suggests that there are a few good, if there are a few good people to work with, Sodom should be saved. So what to make of the events of the last few months, culminating in, election, in the election this past week? According to accounts in the New York Times, there are quite a number of concerned Americans looking into moving out of the United States. Before the election, immigration officials in Canada have experienced a noticeable surge in inquiries from US citizens. However, as a community, as citizens, we cannot simply run away from our problems. Moving away <clears throat> would be the equivalent of building an ark and riding out the next few years, hoping all the problems exposed by the divisive politics of our times will just get washed away. And as the Abraham story suggests, we cannot walk away from or ignore the many millions of our fellow citizens who do not vote the way we do, the way you, you or I might have, do not see things as you or I do, but might be willing to work towards a shared compromise. We need to, as Jeremiah urged, search our cities and our rural areas for those who seek justice and peace and reach out to them and work together. Abraham imagined that there were good people to be found in stone, enough to build a just society. As we move beyond this election, can we transform our bitterness into reconciliation? Can we regain the spirit of cooperation and shared purpose that defines America? Like Abraham, we must ask ourselves and each other, perhaps it can be found, Ulaim Sa'un Sham. American mythology and culture is that we are a grand melting pot, an e pluribus unum, out of the many, one. Unified by a sense of shared destiny, collective purpose, and common future and a voluntary willingness to be subject to written and unwritten laws and standards. That common consensus is renewed whenever we have a peaceful transfer of power from one leader to, enough, to the next. We reaffirm these sacred American values as part of something we call the greater good, the public good, or the common good. The political climate we have lived in for the last few decades has blurred our sense of the common good and our shared destiny but our current condition is recently acquired, not a natural one. We know in our hearts what America stands for. Can we stop living in a separate red country and a separate blue country and move into a shared purple country? We need to be like Abraham, telling ourselves and each other, Ulai, it is possible. Tuesday's vote gave no one the upper hand, neither Republicans nor Democrats won control. Each party gained something and each party lost something. Maybe it's just as well. While the occupant of the White House may change, we are still pretty much where we were before with an almost evenly divided Congress and nation. The prayer for our country that we read, that we read on Shabbat mornings is a call to seek the greater good, to forge a common bond in order that we can be an influence for good throughout the world. A victory at the polls of a little more than 50% is only a plurality and certainly not a mandate to continue with entrenched partisan warfare. We cannot blame the other side for having their set of values and convictions as to what is just and right, but achieving consensus on how to move forward is the next challenge and it will require those from the other side willing to, to it will require us to find those from the other side willing to dialogue and compromise. It will not be easy. But as Thomas Paine also wrote in The American Crisis, what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. In his appendix to Common Sense, Thomas Paine wrote, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. As we move forward into a new administration, as we search for common ground and consensus to make a new beginning, may we find in our hearts the courage to reconcile and work together, making Abraham's hopeful question our own conviction, Ula Yimsa Unsham, 
perhaps we will find it there. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom and thank you, David. Shakach. Yeah. Mahatsi Kaddish on page 184, then rise for the